24 years before I was even born. In 1956, as the sun was setting, a man stood in uniform at the border between the countries of Hungary and Austria. The iconography on his shirt and his arm told you of his national allegiances, his rank, his position in life, literally the dividing line between some on one side and others on the other. Now, at this night, one universal between people who lived on both sides of the line were cigarettes. And for him, this cigarette was no big deal. It was just another break from his job, another butt on the floor of the guardhouse. But for me, this cigarette would secure the safe passage of this woman. This cigarette would change my natal language, the color of my passport, and my identity. This is my grandmother, and she grew up in a small town in Hungary, and like many others at the time, emigrated to Canada. I only knew her as granny, but in a life lived before my, my own, she was a pioneer of women in science, working towards her PhD in biochemistry. So much of who I am came from my granny. You know, little things like, cut the butter straight, don't scoop it off the top. <laughs> but also very foundational things of who I am, like how important your family is to you, and don't forget where you come from. You know, other than one trip where I spent a little bit of time visiting distant family in Hungary, I still do feel like Hungary is somehow a part of who I am. Because who you learn from in your life defines so much of who you'll become and what you do. You know, we're all human, but culture is how we learn to be one. And uh, human cultures have played a huge part of deciding where people live and how they behave across human civilization. You know, as early humans evolved, uh, language served as this cheat sheet for do you do things the same way I do? And even today, you're far more likely to help someone who yells for help in your natal language than in any other. And so culture can be this unifying force, but also, of course, a very divisive one and it's structured all of human civilization. And of course, now we know uh, that humans aren't the only cultural animal out there. Animal culture pervades all facets of their lives. And in this amazing study in chimpanzee communities across Africa, they, these primatologists documented the different ways, the different solutions that chimpanzees have figured out uh, how to live. But because of the destruction of their habitat, mostly caused by us, chimpanzee communities are very isolated. And so it's hard to understand if I never meet a stranger, do I need a sense of I am Canadian if you just know me as Shane? But in the world's oceans, there's this one ocean nomad that feels like they live in this boundless blue. And in that giant area, they are succeeding together to build multicultural societies. You see, sperm whales have been sperm whales for longer than us humans have even been walking upright. And so their stories are deeper than our stories. And stories like this one, like this family, of a mother can opener swimming through a deep and dark and often dangerous ocean, just working together to raise and defend their calves, like this tiny little one named Hope underneath. Since 2005, I've had the immense privilege of spending thousands of hours in the company of Hope and Can Opener's family, and now about 30 to 40 other families off uh, the Caribbean island called Dominica. It's really been the first time that anyone's come to know these biblical leviathans as individuals, as brothers and sisters, as mothers and daughters. And when I think about spending half of my life learning from and listening to someone who is fundamentally different than me, I've taken away a lot of sort of universal lessons. Lessons like spend time with your siblings because eventually they move away. One of the 
novel things that we were able to do with so much time in the company of whale families is follow the lives of the young males as they grow up and leave their families. You see, if you're a male sperm whale, the first 15 years of your life is spent in this hyper-social community of families where you're born. You know, when you're a teenager, you sound like your mom, you behave like your mom, and then all of a sudden, you start this uh, incredible voyage around the world to live a mostly solitary life until you grow to be the size of about two school buses and really become Moby Dick. <laughs> you know? So there's this big shift, which isn't so unlike our late teenage years, where you leave behind your family and go out on your own. But for the families that stay in Dominica, they learn from generations of strong female leaders. Grandmothers, mothers, and daughters who will live together for life. And they've learned this fundamental truth that both they and we know, which is that family is critical to our survival. When Fingers makes a deep dive, she's an elder in Hope's family. She's diving so long that she's holding her breath for over an hour, and she's going three times deeper than modern nuclear attack submarines. Her unique nose houses the most powerful natural sonar system, and it means that she can exploit part of the oceans that we find difficult to even get to, and that makes sperm whales a critically important part of the oceanic ecosystem. When they talk to each other, they talk in these distinct pattern sequences of clicks with stereotyped rhythms and tempos, and we call those codas. And the norm for conversation is to overlap one another and to match each other's calls. Uh, and it sounds very exciting, uh, and it has this elegant complexity to what at least initially seemed like a very simple system of clicks and pauses. And it sounds like this. And I've recently launched uh, a much larger project working with international researchers, including some here at Berkeley, uh, called Project SETI. And the mission here is to try and decode what sperm whales are saying, to answer that fundamental question of what is so important to whales that they need to talk about it. But what we've learned from our work in Dominica and around the globe is that they mark these cultural differences with different dialects, different sets of codas. All families that speak the same dialect are a part of a clan. And Hope and Can Opener's clan is the Eastern Caribbean clan. And they all learn a very special coda called the one plus one plus three. You know, with scientists, we use very common, com complicated nomenclature, one plus one plus three. I had no idea where that came from. <laughs> but uh, this call is unique to them, right? It's only ever been recorded in the Caribbean, and calves take about two years to learn to make it right. And they really need to, because when two families meet at sea, they need to make a decision about whether or not they're going to spend time together and collaborate. Because as it turns out, if you speak the same dialect as me, we'll spend time together. And if you don't, we won't. Because behavior is what you do, but culture is how you've learned to do it. Sperm whales are all sperm whales across the globe. But how they've learned to live their lives are very different. In the same way that some of us use chopsticks and some of us use forks, these sperm whales differ in what they eat and how they eat, where they roam, how fast they move around, their habitat preferences, their social behavior, and to be honest, probably a, a, a myriad of ways that we don't even understand yet. Right? These cultures are fundamental to their identities. And they use acoustic markers to label where they belong. Right? And that makes these sperm whale clans the largest culturally defined cooperative groups outside of humanity. And right now, I'm running this large project with international researchers from around the world across three different oceans, where we're mapping the boundaries of these sperm whale clans. Because whales have been traditionally managed based on pretty much arbitrary lines that were defined by the whalers that were killing them. 
And then more recently, through international conservation policy based on really broad uh, genetic patterns that are mostly driven by those solitary males that swim from one ocean to the other, from one clan to the other, moving the genes around. But the genetic patterns just can't capture the diversity of a whale's life in the same way that we can't imagine that what's encoded in human genetics can teach us everything that it is to be a human. And that's why we need to focus our conservation on the patterns of cultural diversity that we see in these female-led clans, you know, that they're self-identifying into. We need to ignore the systems that we've used before of whaling imposed by us and genetics that simply can't capture the diversity that we know exists and shift to a new system. And that's what the Global Coded Dialect Project was about to drive home that there's this new scientific understanding that can serve to, as a foundation to totally restructure international conservation policy. We're going to do things differently because we listen to and learn from those to whom it matters the most. And we need to do that now because, sadly, we've been killing whales for hundreds of years. And we do so now mostly out of ignorance rather than intent. We hit them with our ships from the ever-growing shipping fleet that brings us the economy from around the world. We entangle them in our omnipresent leftover fishing gear, like Digit, who's in Hope's family. This picture's from when she was only three. And every calf counts. When you have small families that desperately need females to perpetuate themselves, if they don't survive, you lose the family. And when we lose a family, we lose generations of traditional knowledge of how to succeed as a Caribbean whale. You lose the indigenous wisdom from your grandmother's grandmother of all the solutions on how to live there. And that can't be replaced even if the global population could swim into the Caribbean again. Because these would be different whales from elsewhere who do things differently who've learned from different grandmothers and are missing the solution on how to succeed there. So these cultures aren't just animals who've learned to do things differently because they never meet. These are really the link between the ocean that they live in and the animals that live there. It's a bond between where and who. And that's why we um, can't just do wildlife conservation based on total numbers or genetic stocks. We need to have uh, the definition of biodiversity include cultural diversity. <laughs> these secrets are the secrets that are allowing these species to survive. They're the viable solutions to species survival and we need to model our framework for conservation around that. Now, in, an, in the era of a climate crisis, in the shadow of a global pandemic, on a day where millions of humans are facing imminent threat from war, it's totally academic to talk about animal communication and whale culture. But it's a bigger message than that. If you can take one message from the culture of whales, it's the power of community. You know, that in the face of these unimaginable obstacles, the solution is to come together. And the last few years have taught us to do the exact opposite. And that's why this Hungarian-Canadian scientist is going to spend the next few days learning from others who come from elsewhere and have learnt from different grandmothers. You know, we're all here because we believe in driving a revolution from the heart of nature. We all belong here together. <laughs> Thanks. We're forming this new we because we believe in building a bigger definition of it so that we can overpower the boundaries that we've created between all of the groups that exist between us when we leave this conference. So what are you going to learn from the next couple of days that you're going to bring back to your community to help shatter those boundaries? Because the big 
take home from being a sperm whale is to build bigger definitions of us. You know, they're fundamentally different from you and I. There's no doubt about it, right? But we can talk and have talked in the last 10 minutes or so about shared values that we all understand. Learn from your grandmother, you know, love your siblings, be a good neighbor. Because if we're going to preserve life, ours and theirs, we need to find ways to coexist above and below the surface and value cultural diversity in our society and our ecosystem. Thank you. <laughs>